Radio, welcome to another edition of Music Rocks. I'm your host, Torian, and in this episode, we'll be music rocking at Chamber Studios, where we'll be touching base with Grammy nominated producer and musical genius, the incomparable Nicholas Franker. Catch you guys in a minute. So we're here with man of the moment, Mr. Nicholas Michael. What's going on? I'm cool, my brother. You alright? Yeah. Well, here at Music Ross, what I like to do is start at the beginning of the journey of the musical guest. So tell me about how you got into music. Um, I don't think I was ever out of it, <laughs> to be honest. But um, I remember my mother saying to me that the lady who was in the bed next to her when she had me, and I was on her chest as a baby, the lady looked at my hands and said, he's going to be a musician. I was maybe a day over. So, um, I first started playing the piano when I was three. I was given a toy piano that was two octaves long. It was red. I can still remember it. And it was about six inches off the floor. And I used to sit on the floor and pick out the songs that were on the radio. The melodies I used to be able to pick them up. So I think they thought that at that point I had musical talent. I went to Piano lessons at five, piano course up to grade eight, which I finished when I was 13 or 14. All the while, I was delving into all kinds of other things on the side. And I remember one of my examiners said, it is clear I have a very creative mind, but I should try not to improve on the classical composers. Because I used to go into the exam and like, I really feel you should have done this, and I would change up. They didn't really appreciate that. <laughs> well, being a musician that has influenced so many, who are some of your musical influences? Um, well, I feel like to answer that question, I would have to be acknowledging that I have influenced people. But okay, <laughs> let us assume. Um, I would have to say my first major musical influence was my father. My father was not a musician, but he was a great appreciator of music. He was a creator of music. He is who taught me what improvisation is. My father was a lover of the blues, and every song that came out, and he liked, he would find a way to bring it into the blues. And that became, I think, the single most determining factor in how I approach music up to now. Um, everything that I have done since then, I think, in some way comes back to that concept. One, that you have to put your own stamp on what you do. It is important that when somebody hears what you do, that they can identify as being different. Not, even if they don't know who you are, they can say, well, listen, there's something different about this, and I either like it or dislike it, because it's important to make them have an opinion. You step away from the music and come up with a perspective. Mm. So I say that, tell me about your creative process. Uh, I, I don't know that I have a process. I have a way of just allowing things to happen. Some of these songs that I have done, particularly at Crop Over Time, have emerged out of what you would call accidents. When I had first started working with Edwin, and he came in the studio. We, I was doing a remix for Tony Bailey, who was in the band. And Edwin just heard the drums and the bass. And he said, man, I have a song that I feel will work on that rhythm. I said, well, sing it to me. And he said, yeah. I said, yeah, that could work on this rhythm. And then he put it down. And then, that became the biggest thing that we had in years. Yeah. But it wasn't a plan, it wasn't like, okay, so we can make this, you know. But then there would be another time that you would actively sit down and say, right, like when they did Ragga Ragga with Plastic Bag, like, my intention was to create saying that sounded like it was already there, but was different from everything else. So it was like, okay, I wanted to make saying that it had in the Calypso, it had in reggae, but it was neither of the two. And I 
he sat on them, planned it, and did it, and made it. So then that became what people just call Ragged right? Souls. Yeah. Over the years, you become a master in your craft. I did. I either have to create or create in many projects. So tell me your favorite project, project today. <laughs> there are two aspects to that. One is that I do not marry myself to what I do. I view the process as letting go of something. And in the process of letting go, you are one of it. So I have made thousands of songs, but I listen to the songs now as a person that is just listening to the song and I pick all kind of words in it. So I can't really say that I have a favorite in that sense. I'm not attached to them in that way. But on the other hand, I am I am moved by the impact on others. That same year when I was working with him and he did voice in my head. The way that that song can spraddle the musical environment in terms of what was established in like the Calypso and you know, what was the place and what wasn't. And the way that it brought young people into the art form, right? And the kind of impact emotionally that the song had on people made me feel like we had done something of value. Because as I said at the very beginning, if people are indifferent to what you make, you just start making it. You don't really need people to love it. You just need people to have an opinion. You need it to force a person to say, well, you see this, I like this, or you see this, I hate this. I just don't like it, and this is why I create that. Because that's what art is, it is about creating discussion. 